Hi, and welcome to Integrating Imagery Data into GIS Projects and Educational Programs. Uh, I'm a GIS person. I've been using ArcGIS Desktop for a number of years, and when I started using remote sensing, I found that there were some concepts and techniques that I really lear need to learn the background for before effectively using remote sensing in my GIS projects. The material uh, for this PowerPoint are based on work from the iGET Remote Sensing Exercises and Concept Modules and from the Geotech Center Module courses, both of which are funded have been funded by the National Science Foundation. Well, acquiring information about a natural feature or phenomenon, such as the Earth's surface, without actually being in contact with it, is the USGS definition for remote sensing. And how can it be used? Well, we use it over for land use planning. We can look back at uh, land use in the past, see where it is today, and do some uh, change detection. So this happens to be Las Vegas. You can see it was quite a bit smaller uh, in 1975 than it was in 2010. And then I can look at the difference between the greening of Las Vegas before and after. And since it's a desert, it actually got greener. Agriculture uses remote sensing for precision agriculture. You can look at water use, fertilizer use, um, pesticide use, and make uh, educated decisions on how your crop is doing. We use it for weather, so from day to day, and for climate, for so long-term changes of our uh, weather. It's also used in natural disasters. So here this is a, a wildfires, so you can use it before, during, and after a wildfire. There are two types of sensors I want to talk about that are used for remote sensing. One is active. So th in active, the energy source is provided by the, the sensor. So LIDAR and SAR are two of these uh, types of active. One uses laser beams and the other one uses radio waves to uh, strike the object and, and then collect the sen sensors. Passive, though, uses the energy from the sun. Landsat, MODIS, ASTER, and many of our other um, imagery that we get use uh, the sun as the energy source. And these sensors can be on satellites, they can be on aircraft, manned and unmanned, and more and more we're seeing it on drones, and it can even be on vehicles on the ground. The human eye is really a passive sensor. It's using the reflected energy from the sun on objects, our brain, our eyes collect the information, our brain processes it, and then we see the image. This is the graph of the electromagnetic spectrum, and you can see that we use just a small part of the electromagnetic spectrum between 400 and 700 nanometers. But the spectrum goes from very long wave radio waves all the way up to very high energy um, gamma radiation. Well, sensors on satellites collect uh, information from multiple regions of that electromagnetic spectrum, and they include regions that our eyes can't see. So the sun's energy can be transmitted, scattered, absorbed by objects, and then re-emitted. And you can see our satellite here, it's at the top of the atmosphere. So already the energy has gone through the atmosphere to the object. The object then re-emits that energy, and it again trans emits uh, through the atmosphere. Data is then stored on the satellite until it's uh, in visual contact with the ground collection station, where it is uh, then transmitted to the ground. This happens to be Eros Data Center and its uh, satellite um, collecting station. It is then processed and readied for uh, display and, and acquisition by us on their USGS websites. Each sensor on the satellite collects data in a specific wavelength region. These are numbered and they're called bands or channels. I'm going to try to use the word bands consistently, but you may see channels also in your readings. 
you can see our eyes see just a small portion of this electromagnetic spectrum uh, where these Landsat satellites are collecting energy. The gray shaded areas are regions of the electromagnetic uh, spectrum where there's atmospheric windows. So remember I said it's coming through the atmosphere from the sun, it's being transmitted back and reflected up to the satellite. Well, there are some places where it is absorbed and it's not a good place to try to get information. They actually place these sensors in regions where there is a good space. So you can see uh, the gray shaded areas are places where good collection can occur. Here's Landsat 8 band numbers, so 1 through 11. We're going to be using uh, 1 through 7. This is Landsat 7. And you'll notice that Landsat 1, seven, uh, Landsat 7 band 1 is opposite Landsat 8 band 2. So if you're using Landsat, you have to know which regions of the atmosphere, which band is going to be used so that you can use it correctly. When I first started thinking about this uh, and using a lot of GIS, to me a, a, a base map was a good way to locate the other data I was going to be using. And generally it was just one layer and it was generally colored using uh, Roji Biv uh, visualization by a computer monitor. It was the color it was, you couldn't change it much. Well, with remote sensing, all of that is quite different. Re with remote sensing, you get one raster data layer for each sensor on that satellite. Image colors that are based on the regions of the electromagnetic spectrum, and some of them we can't see, so we're visualizing things that we normally can't see. So, what did that raw data look like? That was fascinating to me. It's really grayscale, so right now this is showing uh, Landsat 7, I believe, and the different data layers and what you would see if you looked at each one individually. So there's the numbers, uh, the wavelengths, as well as the um, part of the electromagnetic spectrum that it uh, portrays. This is uh, a listing of the folders the files that you would get, uh, data layers uh, that you would get in your folder when you download Landsat data. So the .tar is the original data, tar zg is the data unzipped once, and then you unzip it twice and you get all the different band layers. So here you can see band 1 through 7 and some other uh, data about the data. And this is for Landsat 5. This is what one layer looks like. So here's the grayscale values. And it's light gray to white almost. Almost to black. Different grayscale layers. And each one has a value which is called its digital number. That's the brightness of it. So if we take a closer look at what a band 4 brightness and its digital number for Landsat 8 is. Here we zoom in and I can see my Landsat 8. If I zoom a little bit further, the brightness of buildings. Pretty obvious it looks like very rectangular building and uh, the outside of the building. If I zoom in even more to a pixel, and remember these are Landsat, so it's 30 by 30 meter pixels, I can actually go in and identify the value of that pixel. And here it is 50,500. So it's a lot of numbers. You can look at the other values. And the darker values are, are lower numbers. The brighter lump values are the lighter, higher um, digital numbers. Well, the value of having the ability to use different bands means that I can take any three bands and combine them and get an image. Here we're creating composite images using three bands and telling the computer, well, show me this image using three bands, one for used for red, one for green, and one for blue. 
and create an image. So I have three different ones here. This is a Landsat 7 composites for natural or two color. We also have a false color and then uh, Ezra uses the term pseudo color for this one. Other places you're going to see false color. But each one of these use three bands and the numbers in, are the band numbers. 321 for natural, 543 for false, and 753 for pseudo. Why would I want to use different ones? Well, if you look closely, you can really see things that you can't see in the natural color very well. Um, the red in the false color middle image, that's really green. And it, the uh, sort of steely blue color is urban. So um, composites can tell you things or show you things that you wouldn't normally see. Uh, remote sensing imagery has different resolutions for its different things. One is spatial, the size of the uh, area on the ground of one pixel and the size of the image footprint. Temporal, which is how often the image is collected for that location. Radiometric, that is the sensitivity of the collector, very slight differences of emitted or reflected energy. So those numbers we saw 50,500, that was radiometric uh, sensitivity. And then spectral, the specific wavelengths of the spectrum collected by that sensor. So we're going to compare a little scale of high spatial resolution where it, the image and the pixel size are meter to submeter. So you can really identify very small objects less than a, a meter in size. More difficult, but anything larger than the uh, resolution is going to be identifiable and it's usually a pretty small footprint for that area and there's just a little teeny graphic of a, a small footprint in relative and we're going to see the others. Moderate spatial resolution generally 30 meter pixels and we're talking a lot about Landsat. Landsat is generally 30 meter pixels so you can't really identify objects smaller than a meter than 30 meters on Landsat and it has a moderate area uh, resolution. So comparing those high uh, spectral resolution to moderate sp spatial resolution you can see that uh, covers a much bigger footprint. Well the low spatial resolution that's MODIS large uh, kilometer pixel sizes so anything smaller than a kilometer you're not going to be able to identify it and it has a very large footprint. <clears throat> so you can see the different relative size from high to moderate to low. Sensitivity is really important on the radiometric resolution. So if it's got low resolution, uh, it has fewer values in each pixel. High radiometric has can detect much smaller differences. So even though Landsat 7 and Landsat 8 both are 30 meter pixels, Landsat 7 has 256 possible brightness values, where Landsat 8 can have many, many more, about 65,000 more, I think. Now, it doesn't mean that the objects that you can identify would be smaller than 30 meters, but it will show you the difference between two pixels. And even though you might not be able to see it with your eyes, your computer can then really look at and, and, and see the differences. The reason I'm focusing on Landsat, though, is it is free. So in education, it, it's very useful because of its no cost. But really, most of your concepts that you would be teaching, you can teach them using Landsat. And then if you can get higher resolution or uh, more current or other data, the concepts are going to be similar. You can access it via website. Um, much of the data is downloadable. That which isn't readily downloadable, it can be prepared for you seamlessly and be sent to you with usually within two or three days. 
It's also got an archive of data from 1972 to present. And generally, there are many software packages that can, can be used to analyze uh, Landsat data. Just want to bring it up again. <laughs> the Landsat missions do use different band numbers. So if you go out and download data, make sure you know which Landsat you're working with if you're going to be doing composite images. Another thing is um, we can use these different radiometric bands that we can't see to help us visualize patterns that wouldn't be easy to see otherwise. One of them is uh, it uses band algebra. You can see the equation there, NDVI equals near infrared plus red divided by near infrared minus red. This is the uh, normalized difference vegetation index, and it shows the greenness. This um, graphic is from ArcGIS Pro and DVI, and you can definitely see the green areas are healthy vegetation or um, robust vegetation. The urban areas look red. We can create graphics called spectral signature graphs that can help identify uh, the type of feature you're looking at. So each of the graphs are made from the pixels, including all of the bands that you have. So you get all those data layers. For depth, say Landsat 8, you get eight separate values for each pixel. And you can graph those values. Um, here we have one the reflectance values versus the, the wavelength for each of these pixels. And you can begin to identify, say, healthy beets versus stre stressed beets or soil, water, healthy vegetation, altered rocks. So um, it's useful for identifying particular features and creating um, ways to look at your data and identify healthy vegetation versus unhealthy. <coughs> Two of the ways that we use um, remote sensed imagery is for image classification. And it's useful for places where you can no longer go back and look at it. Say in 1980, uh, San Fernando Valley, you, you can't readily go back. But if you have its imagery, you can then investigate what things were like and look at change detection. So here you can look at past and current. And with um, unsupervised classification, the computer says, I'm going to group these into the number of classes you tell me. So you may say, give me 15 different uh, types of classifications. The computer will generate 15 different classes. And you then have to group those classes into things that you think are the same thing, urban, vegetation, soil, water, and color them effectively. The other uh, type of classification is supervised, and there you actually go in and pick pixels you think are a particular type of feature, and you make what's called a signature file, which your signature graphs can help you do. Uh, and you then say, okay, computer, this is the values I want, and I want you to put them in the same class, and it's going to be a class of soil, water, vegetation, whatever. It, both of these are art with science. It takes some time and some talent to do it, but it's a way of looking at an area that you can't go out and easily field check, although the best thing to do is to be able to go out and field check it eventually. A lot of the concepts that I've been talking about, um, the participants for the iGET project actually have made YouTube videos. So the iGET Remote Sensing Education channel on YouTube has short videos on all sorts of different types of concepts that may be very helpful for you to understand uh, a concept or to teach a concept. This is part of an exercise that we'll be doing at uh, the ESRI conference and it's going to be on San Fernando Valley and we'll be looking at creating uh, composite images 
uh, clipping those images, using NDVI, creating signature graphs, and if time permits, we'll look at classification. We won't be using ArcGIS Pro. We'll be using ArcGIS Desktop. But Pro has some really neat features where you can um, begin to automate things using tasks and then chain together different functions. So here you could composite clip and do an NDVI. So um, it's, it's one way to um, chain together functions and have it automated. 